If you're a human, you've probably at some point or another used a microwave oven. While you're no doubt familiar with the device itself and its amazing ability to make parts of a hot pocket approximately the temperature of the sun, while other parts as frigid as your ex's heart, you're probably less familiar with the orphan who never finished grammar school who invented it. Or at least, we hope you don't know much about him, because that's who we're going to talk about in today's video, as well as in the bonus fact where we're going to explain how microwaves have a propensity to cook certain things so unevenly. But to begin with, enter our hero. Hero of today's video, a man named Percy Spencer. Born in 1894, at the age of just 18 months old, Spencer's father died and his mother soon left him to his uncle. Naturally, this being the late 19th century, with death everywhere, his uncle died too, in this case when Spencer was just seven years old. Out of necessity, Spencer subsequently left grammar school and entered the workforce, as you do when you're just a kid. Ultimately, at the age of 12, he began working from sunup to sundown at a spool mill, which he continued to do until he was 16 years old. At this time, he heard about a nearby paper mill that was electrifying, which intrigued him. He thus began learning what he could about electricity, and despite having no formal training in electrical engineering, nor even as noted finishing grammar school and still being a teenager, he managed to become one of three people who were hired to electrify the plant. At the age of 18, Spencer decided to join the US Navy after becoming interested in wireless communication directly following learning about the wireless operators aboard the Titanic when it sank. While in the Navy, he made himself an expert on radio technology. He states of this, I just got hold of a lot of textbooks and taught myself while I was standing watch at night. He also subsequently taught himself trigonometry, calculus, chemistry, physics, and metallurgy, among many, many other subjects. Fast forward to 1939, where Spencer, now one of the world's leading experts in radar tube design, was working at Raytheon as the head of the power tube division, which was no doubt a killer pickup line when he was hitting on all of the ladies. It was at this point that Largely due to his reputation and expertise, Spencer managed to help Raytheon win a government contract to develop and produce combat radar equipment for MIT's radiation laboratory. This was of huge importance to the Allies and became the military's second highest priority project during World War II, behind, of course, the Manhattan Project. It also saw Spencer's staff rise from 15 employees to 5,000 over the course of the next few years. Among other achievements during the war, he managed to increase production of radar sets for the military from 100 per day to 20. 2600 per day using the same number of workers. He did so by designing a machine that could more or less mass produce the magnetrons in the radar set. The machine worked by stamping thin cross sections of tube out of silver solder and copper. The cross sections would then be piled on one another in a specific fashion and then cooked on a conveyor belt oven. They would then meld together to form the final finished magnetron tube. The previous best known method for developing these same tubes was to machine them out of solid metal, which was a much more time consuming and resource wasteful process. On top of this, Spencer also figured out several ways to make these radar systems significantly more sensitive. In the end, his radars attached to bombers flying at relatively high altitudes could even detect German U-boat periscopes. For his work in this area, he was awarded the Distinguished Public Service Award, which is the highest award a civilian can receive from the US Navy. Alright, so now you might be wondering what time it is in this video about microwave ovens. Come on now! Get to the point. Well, while Spencer was working on building magnetrons for radar sets, he was standing in front of an active radar set when he noticed the candy bar he had in his pocket melted. Spencer wasn't the first to notice something like this with radars. In fact, one thing workers used to do to warm up when cold was stand in front of the equipment while it was on. <laughs> that sounds safe. Naturally, being an expert in these things helps ensure you don't screw up and accidentally kill yourself. Okay, good, at least there's that. Still, I'm not sure I'd do I'd not be like, yeah, I'm just gonna tear the door off my microwave and use it to warm my hands because, I don't know, that sounds terrifying. As long as it's not set to too powerful relative to how close you're standing to it, or you allow yourself to get too hot, it turns out it's actually perfectly safe. But still, I'm still gonna say... <laughs> Don't try this at home, kids. On that note, contrary to popular belief, the type of radiation emitted by microwave ovens is non-ionizing. This means that it doesn't contribute to your chances of getting cancer like x-rays, ultraviolet light, etc. do. People think that? Outside of potential burn risks, experiments done with rodents have yet to show any major adverse effect to prolonged exposure to microwaves at the 2.45 GHz range seen in most microwave ovens, even with continual exposure over their lifetime. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like we'd definitely know. <laughs> it's like we'd know by now if microwaves were giving us cancer because everyone's using them all the time. And you'd see that there'd be, you know, there'd be much more cancers in college students. In any event, going back to Spencer and his melted chocolate bar, it got him thinking. 
And so it was that shortly thereafter, he and some other colleagues began trying to heat other food objects to see what would happen. The first one they heated intentionally was popcorn kernels, which became the world's first microwaved popcorn. Spencer then decided to try to heat an egg. He got a kettle and cut a hole in the sides, then put the whole egg in the kettle and positioned the magnetron to direct the microwaves into the hole. The result was that the egg exploded in the face of one of his co-workers, who was looking into the kettle as the egg exploded. I feel like there's definitely an egg on his face joke here, but a boom boom tsh, but I don't know. Spencer then created what we might call the first true microwave oven by attaching a high density electromagnetic field generator to an enclosed metal box. The magnetron would then shoot into the metal box so that the electromagnetic waves would have no way to escape, which would allow for more controlled and safe experimentation. He then placed various food items in the box and monitored their temperature to observe the effect. The company Spencer was working for, Raytheon, then filed a patent on October the 8th, 1945, for a microwave cooking oven, eventually named the Radar Range. This first commercially produced microwave oven was about six feet tall and weighed around 750 pounds. The price tag on these units was about $5,000 a piece, which is expensive, but if you put that in today's money, $72,000. It wasn't until 1967 that the first microwave oven that was both mildly affordable for some, $495 or about $3,900 today, and reasonably sized, a countertop model became available. Still, if you had one of those, you were a baller, as I've discussed on my channel Business Plays, which you can find linked to below. Incidentally, it wasn't until microwaves became extremely popular in the 1970s that they were commonly known as microwave ovens or just microwaves. Before that, they were typically known generically as electronic ovens. And if you're wondering, Spencer himself did not receive any royalties for his revolutionary invention. Rather, Raytheon simply gave him $2, which is $15 today as a bonus. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Raytheon. You heroes. If you think that's bad, soon on our Brain Food Show podcast, we will be covering the rather ridiculous story of the guy who invented the synthetic diamond on his own time and then had the company he was working for, GE, take his invention and give credit to some other people who had been working on a machine that was trying to create synthetic diamonds but just didn't work. This was essentially to save face via making it seem like GE hadn't wasted millions on the project when one of their employees had not only told them he could do it for under $1,000 before they even tried tried the expensive project, but also, when they denied him, did it anyway on his own time with a bunch of scraps. Find our Brain Food Show by searching Brain Food wherever you get your podcasts, one word. But going back to our hero of the hour, Mr. Spencer, besides the aforementioned Distinguished Public Service Award and the $2 bonus, over the course of his life he also received an honorary Doctor of Science from the University of Massachusetts, became a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, member of the Institute of Radio Engineers. Despite having no real formal education, he also became Senior Vice President and member of the board of directors at Raytheon, held over 300 patents, and had a building named after him at Raytheon. Not bad for an uneducated orphan who seemed destined to spend his life working at a spool mill until he changed his fate by self-educating. In the end, Spencer died on September the 8th, 1970, at the age of 76. And now for some bonus facts. Microwave ovens do not cook from the inside out, as many people say. They actually heat from the outside in, very similar to other heating methods. As alluded to, they are actually pretty simple devices. The core components needed for a microwave are simply a magnetron and a high voltage source. If you want to make it a little safer to use, you also add in a metal box with a waveguide, basically just a metal tube, that the magnetron is directing short radio waves called microwaves through into the metal box. These microwaves then bounce around in the metal box. When they encounter certain substances like water, fats, sugars, ceramics, certain polymers, etc., these microwaves via dielectric loss heat up these molecules in a relatively efficient manner. Specifically, with dielectric Electric heating, molecules that are electric dipoles, having a positive and negative charge on opposite ends, will rapidly rotate themselves trying to align with the alternating electric field from the microwaves, thus heating the molecules. This requirement for rotation is why completely frozen foods tend to heat very slowly at first in a microwave, because the molecules aren't free to rotate. So at first, the microwaves are mainly heating the molecules that they can rotate. These free molecules heat up rapidly and, by convection, thaw out some of the frozen molecules, which then get heated simultaneously by convection and the microwaves. This continues until the whole thing is cooked. The slight misconception that they heat from the inside out arises from the fact that some foods that you microwave have a very dry outer cover, such as a crust, which the microwaves penetrate with a little absorption. Thus, the liquid inside will appear to heat up first. This is one of the reasons with frozen food, the center might remain frozen and the outer layer only warm, while the layer just under the crust may be approximately the same temperature as the core of the sun. Yet another common myth surrounding microwaves is that you can't put metal in them. 
In fact, as noted, the very walls of the microwave are metal. You also put metal in there all the time when you cook things like Hot Pockets in those little sleeves they come with. They're lined with aluminium powder, which heats up and, in turn, browns the crust of our convection. Further, if you look closely at the window of a microwave, you'll see a metal mesh there. This is important because it stops the microwaves from cooking the insides of your eyes while you stare through it, waiting for your food to cook. The holes in this mesh are smaller than the wavelengths of the electromagnetic radiation your microwave is producing. This makes it so the waves can't pass through the holes. Visible light, however, is comprised of much smaller wavelengths, so that form of radiated energy passes through the holes just fine, allowing you to see inside your microwave while it's running without your eyes being cooked, which, you know, always a plus. So, if the inside of your microwave is lined with metal and certain food products such as Hot Pockets and Pot Pies have containers that contain metal, why does your microwave manual potentially advise against putting metal in the microwave? While things like water, ceramics, certain polymers, etc. end up converting microwave energy into heat quite efficiently, metals, on the other hand, are great conductors of electricity, which is probably shocking news to you. They're packed with electrons that can move more freely. When these microwaves hit the metal, free electrons on the surface of the metal end up moving from side to side very rapidly. This prevents the electric wave from entering the metal, thus the waves end up being reflected instead. However, there is also the potential that this ends up creating a sufficient charge density that the electrical potential in the metal object exceeds the dielectric breakdown of air. When this happens, it will result in arcing inside your microwave from that metal to another electrical conductor with a lower potential, often the wall of the microwave. In extreme cases, these electrical sparks can end up damaging the wall by burning small holes in it. It can also end up burning out your magnetron in your microwave, or in modern microwaves can provide a surge that ends up damaging sensitive microelectronics, possibly killing your microwave or making it unsafe to use, such as in the case of a hole in the inner metal wall. Another way it can kill the magnetron of your microwave is when enough of the generated microwaves don't get absorbed, such as if the food is wrapped in aluminium foil or mostly enclosed in a metal container. This can create a lot of energy not getting absorbed, with nowhere for it to go but eventually back to the magnetron, which can potentially damage the magnetron. For similar reasons, it's generally inadvisable to run a microwave with nothing in it. On a more mundane note, something like a spoon or metal plate or the like positioned correctly will simply make your food potentially not cook normally. On that note, it is once again actually acceptable to put metal in the microwave under the proper conditions. Some microwaves even have metal grates inside for setting food on, such as is often the case with certain convection microwave ovens. There are also certain types of metal pots and pans that are microwave safe. These all, however, are carefully designed to not cause any problems in your microwave. So I really hope you found that video interesting and useful. Your microwave knowledge just got turned up a notch. If you did, smash that like button. If you didn't, smash that dislike button. And as always, I'll see you next time.